Hello again, I'm Nick Haynes. You're probably fed up of elections already, so it may be a surprise to some of you to know that there is another election going on right now at this moment. It's the election to decide whether or not Kansas City should build a two-mile downtown streetcar line. The reason it may have slipped your mind is that even if you live in Kansas City, Missouri, you're most likely not one of those who got a chance to vote. Only those who live in a specially set up transportation district around the proposed route get a say, and it's a mail-in ballot. 697 voters requested ballots that must be returned by December 11th. That represents about 20% of the voters in the transportation district, which follows the proposed route from Union Station to the river market. The cost of the project, by the way, is $100 million. Backers say, if approved, four streetcars could be running up and down this route starting in 2015 from 6 in the morning until midnight later on weekends. It would be paid for by a one-cent sales tax hike on purchases in the specially set-up transportation district, along with hikes in the residential and commercial property taxes. For example, according to the Kansas City Star, the owner of a $200,000 condo could expect to pay $266 more a year. Now, that's a price worth paying, given the benefits that this service will provide. A more vibrant downtown, says the streetcar's backers, Kitty McCoy and Kite Singleton, the executive director and chair of the Kansas City Regional Transit Alliance. Unconvinced, though, is a familiar face to us, Crosby Kemper III, who today is representing the Show Me Institute, in which he is chairman, and Jeff Stretch Ruhlmaner, a former TIF commissioner who is pocketbook would be pinched by the streetcar project. His two restaurants, Grinders and Grinders West, are inside the special transportation district. And your objection to this Crosby Kemper is what? Well, let's start with the with the election. Um, of course, uh, this is designed by Councilman Johnson and and, and others to have a positive vote. It'll be, it will be the smallest uh, a number of voters committing the largest amount of money in the history of Kansas City. The voters of Kansas City as a whole, of course, have consistently rejected light rail, uh, and uh, and so now we're gonna we're gonna get a mail-in vote. Uh, we had 300 people in the first vote, vote vote for this and commit what actually the total the total was in the original proposal uh, to to the uh, to the feds for this was 168 million dollars. It'll be substantially more if we're going to pay for the entire uh, operating expense. Uh, that's another 3.4 million dollars a year. So we're talking about something close to 200 million dollars that uh, 300 to 400 people will commit the city to, including committing other taxpayer money. It's not just the money that's coming from the property tax uh, and the sales tax. Uh, downtown and in the crossroads. And speaking as a, I, I said to my landlord, I live in the crossroads. I said, "You're going to commit to me." He was urging me to vote for it, and I said, "Okay, are you going to are you going to guarantee that you're not going to raise my rent, the 10 percent uh, that you're going to see your taxes raised?" I didn't get a response to that. Uh, this is going to make life in the crossroads and downtown much more expensive. We're going to have the highest economic activity taxes of any city in our region, uh, any downtown uh, in our region. Uh, and it's going to be have, have been committed by a very small number of people. Also, the cost of this is the highest cost per mile of any light rail project in the United States, highest cost per mile, and we'll have the lowest ridership. Now, the first is, is a fact. The second is my prediction. We'll have the lowest ridership per mile of any light rail project in the United States. Okay, before we get the stretch, how do you respond to that then, Kitty? Studies have shown in, in multiple cities that on, on an initial streetcar line, ridership projections out distance by big margins what the studies have said that would be. So I, I, I think that um, I, I disagree. I think ridership is going to be huge. I think that uh, it is a symbol for all of Kansas City, even though it's only that two miles. Uh, I think it's going to, all of Kansas City will benefit from it. It's going to be, everyone's going to take advantage of it, just like they do all of our cultural assets. I, I have a little bit of, of uh, an issue about the, the cost. I do not believe that the cost projections that Crosby mentioned are correct. And that's what I have to say. Kite. You know, every city that has started on enhanced public transportation has gone through this effort to get through the barricade of people's lack of understanding in a particular city. 
So you look at uh, Dallas, you look at Denver, you look at the other places that have started. They've all said, well, we're different. We'll never do this. It's not the right thing to do for us. And then when the proposition is passed and the system is put, put in place, everybody starts to want to tag on to it. That's exactly what's going to happen. Okay, well, well Stretch, you have two restaurants <laughs> that you would think you would benefit from this because you are going to be right next to the streetcar line. Wouldn't your restaurants benefit from more people riding for free on these streetcars? I would love to say yes, but I don't even get to vote on it. And that's a huge problem I have. Even though my businesses and the properties I have there, I don't get to vote on it. And the majority of the people that are voting on this, this 400 some people, are tenants. Once those rents get jacked up, they're going to move on. And my guess is by 2015, half those people that are in that downtown corridor voting on it now aren't even going to live there. I just don't find it ethical to vote and have someone that doesn't own property vote why my taxes have to go up. Would my restaurants benefit? My restaurants would benefit with one-way streets, synchronized traffic lights, HOV lanes, new street you know, lighting and all sorts of gutters and streets. Infrastructure is what this town needs. And the big problem I have with this whole thing is they keep talking about development along this corridor, this two-mile two corridor. If there are incentives, great. Now we lose those tax monies and TIF funds because you have to give incentives to this. The problem is codes in this town are going to hold up all that progress. You can change this and do all this stuff over here, but if you don't change what is already in, in action, it's not going to merge. Kite. Nick, the naysayers in this town have been saying the same thing that Crosby and Stretch are saying for a long time. That's why we haven't passed anything. They all say it's not going to happen. Every one of our sister cities has seen the same kinds of explosion of, of development and interest and population. So I don't see people going away because their uh, rents rise a little bit. Of course they will. That's, that's normal when you see a more attractive place you have more people looking right now the, the the occupancy rate in downtown among the apartments is about 98 or 99 percent there's a desire to live here and, the, and that's been in great part because of the investments that started under k barnes and have continued to today there's a huge interest and it's that way all over the country people want to move to an urban center where things are happening Has and the streetcar is just yes. a, another very important aspect and this is only the first piece there's going to be extensions to the streetcar and they're going to start right away mark has already applied for uh, alternatives analysis funding they haven't got it yet but that's going to continue and we're going to see this thing expand north kansas city already has a tax potential in place they're not collecting the tax yet but they will go after this and try to get the streetcar to go across the bridge to North Kansas City. So your arguments then, Crosby, I mean, that's why nothing gets done, because it's always about um, the, the money and it is, that's what keeps this community from being held back, unlike those other communities in the country who are willing to take a chance and, and move something forward. Well, I, I, I'm in favor of uh, putting lots of investment into uh, the, the central city and, and improving the cultural amenities. A lot, of, a lot of what we've done, of course, in improving cultural amenities has done, been done with private money, like the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, this is done exclusively with, uh, with public money, local public money. Uh, and and I, I dispute the benefits uh, from this. Many of our sister cities uh, that, are, that are advancing much faster from an economic development point of view and as fast as we are culturally don't have light rail. Uh, that's one of the myths that's been put out by uh, the political class in, uh, in, in this community, but that's simply not true. There are lots of cities that don't have light rail. The cities that do have light rail are not developing faster than we are, but they have the, the one city in, in, in our region that has higher tax per capita than we do. We have the highest tax per capita of all cities in our region, with one exception, Denver. And the only reason Denver has higher is because they've spent $5 billion on light rail. And the voters have gotten a little uh, uh, unhappy about that. So they haven't extended the, 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 the rail system in Denver recently uh, because the voters are a little tired of the, the taxes that they're, uh, they're paying for this. So the question is, what, what real benefit do we get out of this? It is a cultural amenity. I agree with that. There'll be a few more tourists and a few more 20-somethings who will move into the downtown area. But the rents will go up, so the 20-somethings won't really be able to afford to, uh, uh, to live here, so they'll be pushed out to, to some other area. So who's actually going to use it? 
Well, lawyers will use it to take clients to lunch at Crown Center if they're working downtown. Lawyers at Crown Center will use it to take their clients to lunch in the Power and Light District. I'm not sure who else will actually use it. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, who, who will use it? Who is the audience for this? We, this is going to be a free ride. We've talked about this, Kitty. Nick, yes. I have to, I'm sorry let's, for please. interrupting, but uh, I have to counter what Crosby said about Denver. Denver started on this in the mid-80s. They made a one-mile plan. And that started a whole interest in light rail, and they did about two or three lines. Two years ago, the voters of Denver voted $3 billion to extend what they had been doing. So there's no hesitance on the part of the voters in Denver to tax themselves three billion, I'm talking about, no, they, not millions. Correct, they, right, they, they were going to put it on the okay, ballot. Okay, let's let finish, let's let finish. Well, that's basically yeah. what I want to say. Yeah. The voters of Denver debt. are very excited about what their tra transit investments have done for them to the extent they want to do more. Okay. Denver is very walkability, too. I mean, Kansas City is not very walkable. And I'm curious how many voters actually got in on that. We already have our $10 million debt every year with PL. But isn't, isn't the plan here to make Kansas City more walkable? And, is, and isn't this and part of what. Denver downtown in 1985 was a disaster. The, t the hotels were flop houses. There were trucks that motored overnight because oh, Kai, that was the only place where back, that back. they could find to stay overnight because it was so cheap. The, the property owners on 16th Street decided they needed to do something about their downtown, and they coughed up the money to do that initial one-mile line. That was the start of the whole thing, 1985, and today Denver is a, an ex explosion of interest and walkability. We have yeah. a pretty, we're starting walkability in downtown Kansas City, thanks to the investments we've made, and this will make it even more so. Okay, Crosby. I, the comeback of Denver, uh, you know, when I, when I was a banker at uh, uh, UMB, we had a bank in, in Denver, and I, I saw exactly what, what, uh, what Kite saw in Denver, which, of course, actually lasted into the 90s, a little well after the trolley had, uh, uh, was up. The trolley didn't have anything to, bring, uh, to, to do with bringing back downtown Denver. Uh, the, their, their version of the Power and Light District is what, what brought it back. Uh, there's no there's no evidence, and in fact, there are lots of studies. Uh, economists at Berkeley, the St. Louis Fed, the World Bank. There is there is in fact no uh, uh, evidence that development is created uh, by light rail by mass transit. Uh, a certain amount of development is shifted from one part of town to the other, very small amount. Uh, but there's no actual net addition of economic development based on light rail. And there's study after study that shows this. But. Uh Crosby keeps mentioning light rail, but these are streetcars, and if we can show some more video of these, I mean, these are these are not on tracks of any kind, are they, Kitty? These are these are not attached to anything. They're, these are just running on roads. No, no. T tell me about the, how these the actually work. Streetcars actually are on rails. They're on rails. They're okay. on rails. Now, now, the, you have to dig. If you were going to have light rail, you dig deeper. Okay. Okay. So it's a shallower. Uh, dig, but the tracks are indeed there. Um, so th th that's one of the differences between streetcars and, and light rail. They are, are uh, smaller vehicles than light rail. They are less expensive than light rail. Uh, I don't hear a lot about light rail, whereas I hear a lot about streetcars that are being uh, uh, put forth in multiple cities throughout the United States. But I want to go back to the question you asked me earlier, which was who's going to ride? this streetcar. Well, I believe everybody who's within walking distance is going to ride the streetcar. I believe people who come downtown to events are going to want to ride the streetcar. And the young, as far as young people are concerned, I listen a lot to what the people are telling us. The people are telling us, first of all, young people consider it an imposition to be told that they must have a car. Kansas City has done nothing for the small businessman in the crossroads especially. We've done it all ourselves without the help of everybody. By doing this light rail, charging us more, we're going to lose our younger crowd. We're going to have to raise our rents. We got hit with our, you know, 10 years ago they raised all our property taxes through the roof and we ended up, everybody had to leave. How are you going to lose your younger crowd? Can you gain a younger crowd in the downtown area because of streetcars? You theoretically could. The, the people still have to get from point A to point B, even if they're on the streetcar. It's a linear, one-lane road. Everything out after that is four or five blocks. Everything that would be on that little corridor may benefit from that somewhat. 
we don't have a walkability city. We just built a beautiful museum on a hill with a parking garage. No one's gonna walk up those three blocks, four blocks, to get to that performing arts center. Kansas City, Missouri cannot run they have a hard time running certain things, let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> a, a final, How can I say that a, nice? a final word in support of streetcars, uh, you have 20 seconds. Kite. You have to start somewhere. I've been doing this for 40 years, trying to find a way to get the citizens of Kansas City to recognize what they will gain from having an enhanced public transportation system. And now we've got an opportunity because the Missouri legislature established this transportation development district and, and we've taken advantage of that and it's going to be the start. It's going to be the start of a regional th thrust toward public transportation which is ardently desired by many, many people. 20 seconds, Crosby Camp up. The voters have rejected light rail over and over again and this is designed uh, to have the smallest number of people voting. It's very undemocratic. Uh, it will be very, very expensive. It will have the lowest ridership because we have no density in Kansas City. The only successful uh, urban mass transit uh, uh, systems uh, are, are in places where there's high density. This won't create it uh, and so it will be very, uh, very unsuccessful. Uh, uh, from a ridership point of view. It's another, it's another thing that's being imposed on the taxpayers and we're going to end up with the highest tax per capita economic activity ca uh, taxes and property taxes in the, in the most dynamic and creative part of the city and that's a huge mistake from an economic development point of view. Kitty McCoy and Kate Singleton from the Regional Transit Alliance, thank you. Crosby Kemper representing the Show Me Institute today and Restaurateur Stretch, thank you for being with us. December 11th is the date when those mail-in ballots have to be returned. We will know shortly afterward if it's yay or nay on streetcars.